Let me tell you just a little bit about myself briefly, uh, kind of some history and, and how this concept has come about for me. Um, <clears throat> I have, uh, I've always been in some sort of management position um, right out of college. Uh, my degree is actually in organizational communication and marketing, uh, which has very little to nothing uh, to do with what I do now. But I started my career in retail management, and um, uh, it, was, it was really in the retail space that I started to see and recognize and understand there were some dynamic differences in kind of management styles and strategies and techniques. And, um, uh, and I hate to be you know, quite so uh, objective about it, but quite frankly, there were some right ways and some wrong ways. And um, so it was through this process that I started really trying to dive in and understand what makes the difference between a good manager and a bad manager. And, and as I did that, um, between that and research and, and reading, and I started to kind of pick up some basic fundamental characteristics um, that ultimately led to this concept of what are, some, what are some fundamental things that a good manager does that maybe a bad manager doesn't do. And so, um, so I started really looking at the managers that I liked and, and respected um, and appreciated and, and the ones that, uh, uh, that I did not enjoy working with as much. And, um, and then over time, really kind of just started honing in and, and defining that. And, and ultimately, I think the big thing for me is that I've recognized that management is a craft and skill in and of itself. Um, just like, you know, whatever your degree is in, and, and, and let's say you're an accountant, um, those accounting skills, that's a skill and a craft, and you have to continue to learn and develop and, and, and get continued education on what that is so that you become better at your craft. And I believe management is the same way, that we have to see that as a craft in and of itself. And, uh, and we have to continually learn to develop that. Because most of the time, most people get into management because that's the course of their career. They don't get into management because they say, I want to be a manager. Now, I may have been part of the exception to that. I knew I loved working with people um, and, and from a business perspective, no matter what the industry was. I loved working with people and helping them and, and managing um, the people and the processes. And so um, that's why I really started looking at, well, how do I define what my management style is going to be? And then ultimately, over time, as I started sharing that with others, realized there may be some, some valuable information in all of this. So <clears throat> through the course of my career after retail management, um, uh, realized that retail was not for me. And so I got into the finance industry. Um, uh, first management position I had in the finance industry was managing a call center. And uh, uh, from there, kind of worked my way into some other things, including some relationship management, client management. Um, and then uh, worked for a company where I managed account executives um, that managed our client relationships all over North, Central, and South America. And I loved that job, loved that company. And we'll talk more about that company later. Uh, I, I really learned a lot about just the, the culture um, of that company. And so... Uh, again, through this process, what I continue to do is just sort of hone in this craft of management and hone in these skills and, and define them better and polish them out and put them into practice and see what works and, and what doesn't work. Um, and so all of that led to uh, eventually, about six and a half years ago, I left the corporate world. When I left the corporate world, I came in to help a, a technology company, um, a software training company, kind of develop some processes and, and branded themselves a little bit. And, um, and so now I own that company. I started a company called Gorman Recruiting uh, that I also own. And then uh, I own this division, which is called Employer Blueprint, which is specifically about leadership and management training and development. And then I also own a, um, a very small uh, kind of online production company. And so <clears throat> I have about 30 people on payroll right now, and, um, and, and I, I hold that responsibility very dear to me. I think that's the most important thing of the companies and the profit and loss and all those things. At the end of the day, it's those 30 people that I'm responsible for, and, and I, I take that very seriously. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of walk through some of these principles um, that I've developed over time. A lot of these things aren't new. You know, I, I know a few of you are, are kind of going through the, the Dale Carnegie courses, and you may have read a lot of books. And a lot of these things are not going to be new because they're not. In fact, I don't think any management principle is new. I think they've been around for thousands of years. We just define them differently, and you figure out what works for you and what makes sense. So the first thing uh, we're going to do is we've all get, got to get on the same page. And so I want to talk about some reasons um, to become a manager and some reasons not to become a manager. And, and let's start, unfortunately, we'll kind of start with the negative just so that we can end on a positive. Um, these are some things that I often hear people talk about, the reason that they get into management. One of them is because they want to make more money. 
And, um, and again, what I'm talking about here is reasons not to get into management, okay? If your whole purpose in getting into management and taking that step in your career is because you wanna make a little bit more money, um, you're gonna you're going find yourself very unsatisfied with your career choice. There are a lot of ways to use the skills that you've developed to manage people, uh, or I mean, to, to, to make more money without having any kind of management or supervisory responsibility. And so if that's the reason you're getting into it or that you've gotten into a supervisory or management role, I would encourage you to rethink that. I would encourage you to um, maybe talk to your supervisor and say, you know what, I am making more money. I'm not real happy with this, though. Uh, there's really no job satisfaction for me. And um, because if you don't have job satisfaction, you certainly cannot encourage that in the people that are reporting to you. The next thing is um, <laughs> uh, this one I, I often find funny, and, and unfortunately it's kind of funny in a sad way, not in the, not in the laugh out loud way. But um, I want less stress. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that, that I want to get into management because I want less stress. And I, I think we've all heard those things before where, you know, well, um, if I had their job, you know, they've got it easy. They don't have to do as much, put their feet up on the desk, and life is good. And, uh, and I just want to make sure, again, that we're all on the same page here. I have yet to see an organization where the higher you go up through the hierarchy, they give you less responsibility, less accountability, and less stress. That does not happen. And yet, I hear that a lot. Um, in fact, uh, this was, was funny, and, and, I, and I, I'm not big in social media. I do it for some business stuff, but that's really not my world. But I had to post this. This actually happened uh, just a few months ago, within the last year. I was sitting at a restaurant um, with my daughter. She's seven years old. She loves Chinese food, so we're sitting there having some Chinese. And I overhear these two guys uh, next to us at the table talking, and one of them says, man, I just can't, you know, I'm not, I can't deal with this anymore. And, and I don't know what he did. It, it appeared, based on the way he was dressed, he was a mechanic. And um, he said, you know, all the stuff they have us doing, it's ridiculous. I can't wait. I'm going to start my own business because then I won't have any stress. I won't have to worry about any of this stuff. And um, I so badly <laughs> wanted to say, please rethink that because that's not the way it's going to work. You're going to lose so much sleep when you try this. But, um, but unfortunately, a lot of people really believe that, that there's going to be less stress when they take that next step. And so, again, if, if, if you've not found that out already, I encourage you to rethink that. Because if you have less stress, you probably are not doing your job properly. Because a lot of that is because, and in fact, it kind of goes to this third, third uh, um, reason that I often hear, is that it's kind of the next step in my career. But what happens is, if you don't think about management as a craft and a skill in and of itself, just like you would whatever your industry is, whatever your, your skill set is, whether it's um, uh, client care, whether it's accounting, whether it's IT, whatever it is, if, if you just say, well, management's the next step in my career, then again, you're gonna be very unsatisfied because now all of a sudden your whole priority shifts and it's not always about IT anymore. It's not always about accounting anymore. It's half of my time is spent dealing with other people. And so um, oftentimes people get into that because they think that's the next progressional step, that's where I have to go in my career, and that's not really true. And again, I, I would encourage you, there are, um, there are a lot of ways to advance your career without getting into management. There are a lot of opportunities out there that require certain skill sets that don't really require you to, to be responsible for other people. And so let's talk about, let's kind of flip this on the good side, and let's talk about some reasons to become a manager. And so what we're trying to do here is just all get on the same page um, because I'm hopeful that whenever we get through this that we all can agree that at least one of these reasons is what eventually led all of you into some sort of management role. The first one is that you believe you can make a positive contribution to your company. And you think you can make a greater contribution in a management role than you can as an individual contributor, um, which is the way that I define people that don't have a management role as an individual contributor. And so <clears throat> if you... If you, through the course of your career, say, I, I can do more for this company, I can provide more, um, that may be the right step for you. It may make sense for, for you to take on that extra responsibility, which is, which is really the second piece of this, and that is because you appreciate and thrive on additional responsibility and accountability. Um, uh, that was one of the reasons that I got into management early on is because I appreciate that accountability. I appreciate that responsibility. I, I want that weight on my shoulders. And so that is a great reason to get into management and, and, and agree to kind of take that next step in your career. And then the last one is, and I believe ultimately the most important, and hopefully through the evolution of your management career, if you didn't start out with this as a reason, you end with this as a reason, and that is because you want to make a positive contribution in other people's lives. 
You want to help other people. You want to help them thrive. You want to help them excel. You want to help them exceed expectations. You want to help other people achieve whatever success looks like for that individual person. And so if as a manager you sit here today and think none of those three reasons are me, then again, I'm going to encourage you, and I hope I don't step on any toes. I know I've got HR looking at me here. <laughs> You're probably not in the right role, and, and there's no hard feelings about that. Better to identify that, recognize it, and, and find a place to move on within the organization than to be unhappy, make other people unhappy, and cause greater issues. And so hopefully one of these three reasons are what ultimately have kind of led you or eventually you've come to the conclusion, yes, this is what I appreciate about this this role that I'm in. And, and if you're not there yet, I really want you to get to that point where you say it's about other people because we're, we're really, we're about to dive into that. So the next thing we have to do to make sure that we are on the same page is we have to define management. And we've got to understand what management really is because I'm going to use that word management a lot. And so um, let's make sure we're on the same page. There are thousands and thousands of definitions out there. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you my definition that we're going to kind of base everything on today, but I want to hear from you first. Give me your thoughts on what does management mean? Long Say again? Long sleepless, Long sleepless nights. <laughs> Some truth to that. Yeah. Yeah. Being the person that um, your staff can reflect off of. That's excellent. Remember that concept of reflection. We're going to talk about that in a little while, that your staff can reflect off of. That's very good. What are the thoughts we have about what does management mean? What does it mean to be a manager? Be a leader. To be a leader. Yeah. So I have a, <clears throat> again, nothing new, but I have a, a very strong belief that you don't have to be a manager to be a leader, but you should be a leader if you're going to be a manager. And there's, there's a dynamic difference. In fact, I, I kind of do training separately on management and leadership. There's a whole lot of crossover because I want that manager to be a leader. That's great. What else do we have? What are the thoughts do we have? What's it mean to be a manager? You have to be selfless. Selfless. Very good. Yes. Yes. 100%. So <clears throat> you all, um, you may know of this new website that's out there. Uh, it's spelled G-O-O-G-L-E. <laughs> and um, if it's on Google, it's true, <laughs> right? Like, that, that is the gospel. If it is on Google, that's the way it has to be. That's where we go for all great information. And so if you Google management, you know, it pulls up their first definition. And I'm going to read for you word for word. Now, I, I've been presenting this for a few years now, and I keep thinking it's going to change. So before I do this, I always go back and I look. And, and so this was as of a week and a half ago. This was still the, the first definition that came up, management the process of dealing with or controlling things or people. Can you imagine? But how many people do you know or have you experienced, how many managers have you worked for that take that to heart? That it's about dealing with or controlling people. We have millions of people right now in management positions throughout this country that really believe that's what management is. And that's the reason I get to take that next step because now I get to control people. Instead of helping them succeed and helping to want to make them thrive and, 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 and empower them to be better, I get to control them. I'm going to have less stress, make more money, and control people. Three great reasons to get into management. And so there are a lot of people that really, really believe that. So <clears throat> one of the things that I learned early on and recognized early on in my career, one of the key, just fundamental core things about management is it's not about me anymore. And so I, I really, and I'll admit, I, I fail in this sometimes whenever I'm talking about my team, but I really try to make sure that even my language reflects that, that it's about we, that, that people work with me and not for me, okay? Um, my team knows, like, I hate the word boss. Uh, and they'll say that sometimes jokingly. In fact, uh, Leanne in the office made the comment just earlier about, yeah, the boss said I could work from home tomorrow. And just because she knows that kind of just crawls under my skin a little bit, like just that concept. Because without them, we don't succeed. And I hope that I play a little bit of a role in that as well. But, but we are a team. We work with each other. No one works for me. I, I think that that's demeaning and degrading. So 
So let's talk about my definition. My definition, and this is based on several things that I've read, I've studied, just how I think about it. And, um, and my definition is basically this. It's accomplishing defined strategies and goals through others. Accomplishing defined strategies and goals through others. Let's break this down. So what's the responsibility of the manager? To lead the development of long-term strategies, okay? So if we're gonna accomplish strategies, first we have to have them. And so the manager's responsibility is to lead the development of these long-term strategies. Now, each area of responsibility is gonna be a little bit different in how broad you can get on this, but each area of responsibility, each manager has some form of responsibility around developing some long-term strategies for their team and their area of responsibility. The next thing is define the goals of the team. And we're really gonna dive into this a little bit whenever we start to build these four walls, as I call it. <coughs> Excuse me. But we've gotta define the goals of the team. We've gotta make sure that everybody understands what's expected of them, what's expected of the team, where the team is going. And then develop the goals for each team member. <coughs> so we may have some, based on our long-term strategy, we're gonna have some goals, we're gonna break it down a little bit into some goals for the team, but then each person's gonna be a bit unique in their role of responsibility, their, their um, area of expertise. And so we've got to de develop goals for each individual person as well. Now, <clears throat> this is the last part, and this is the most critical because all three, the other three things that I've just mentioned can be outsourced. Someone else can do that for us. But here's what can't be done. Here's what only the manager can do. Establish accountability and recognition metrics to achieve these goals. So if we're defining management as accomplishing defined strategies and goals through others, accomplishing and through others are what make the manager. Because everything else can be outsourced. Someone else can develop our strategies. Someone else can come up with some goals. Someone else can work with our team one-on-one -on -one and kind of outline some very specific things that each person needs to do. But only you as the manager can accomplish through others through accountability metrics and recognition metrics to make sure that we actually are accomplishing those goals. <clears throat> so that's what makes the difference. Everything else is fairly tactical, but this, this right here, this is the meat. This is what makes the difference. This is what makes a manager a manager. So this whole presentation is around this idea of building four walls of management, okay, and it's these four basic principles. But before we build four walls, the, we've gotta build a foundation. And so there are three key parts to building the foundation. The first one, as Wes had mentioned, selfless. Part one is being, being selfless and not selfish. See, once you become a manager, your priorities are going to shift because it's not about you anymore. Once you become a manager, your priorities shift to, um, to the people that are working with you. The way that you think, the decisions that you make, the language that you use, it's all about helping others now. It's not about me. I may very well make decisions in my management capacity that aren't the best decision for me. They may not give me as much time off as I want. They may not fit into my skill set as well as I would want them to. But it's not about me anymore. I've got to be selfless. It's about other people. And so the first thing we have to do in the foundation is understand once we take on this responsibility, which we've all agreed to do, it's not about me anymore. It's about other people. And we've got to put those other people first. And then the next thing is the manager's mirror. So you talked about reflecting. So here's what I want you to think about. Um, in almost everything we do, we've got to kind of go back and we're going to look at the manager's mirror. And as we go through the workbook later, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Let's look at the manager's mirror. We've got to look at ourselves first. Okay? So even though we're going to be selfless, we need to know who we are. And so we've got to make sure that we understand how we like to be managed. We need to understand our preferred methods of communication. We need to understand our personality, what our pet peeves are. We need to know who we are. We can't be confused by who we are. But here's the other thing. I want you to think for just one second about in your area of responsibility, what's one thing that you are unhappy with with your team? And I'm gonna almost guarantee that's a failure on your part. Because if you think, you know, my team's just not really client-centric, 
You probably are not client-centric. My team's really unorganized. They don't ever seem to be on time. Well, make sure that you're very organized and that you're on time. More times than not, your team is going to reflect their leader. They're going to see what you do, and that's what they're going to emulate because that's what they believe is right, which is why you can have someone that goes to work for an organization and shows up on time every single day without fail, and they go to work for another company, and they're always five minutes late. And, and people don't understand. What's the difference? Well, the difference is because of the company culture and what's deemed appropriate. What does the leader do? What does the manager do? I worked for a company one time, and that became a real issue. Um, in our store, we probably had... 150 employees and it was like you really didn't have to show up on time like that was just part of that that organization's culture and one of the assistant managers got really frustrated with it went to the store manager and said hey I need you to you know mention this in the morning meetings we've got to start showing up on time and he said and unfortunately he recognized this how can I tell them to show up on time when I don't you can't have different expectations than what you have for yourself it, that's exactly right. Yeah, it, you know, and, and it's interesting because a lot of the way that I relate to management, I, I use stories about kids, and it's not because I think people are kids, but I think there's just some inherent human nature. And it's just more obvious in kids, but adults do the same things. And so we are gonna reflect, we are, we are going to reflect the people that are our leader and the people that are leading us. And so, as we look through this, uh, this manager's mirror, let's think about the expectations that are outlined. Have we outlined proper expectations? And again, we're going to dive further into this in a little while, but have we outlined expectations? Because if not, they're going to outline expectations of their own. Do, do the people that are working with us have the support and the tools that they need to succeed? Because if they don't, that's not their fault. They are failing because of you. You've not provided them the tools that they need. And so the way I like to illustrate this is, let's go back to high school for just a second. I know like some people are saying, yes, that's awesome, and some are saying, no, please, let's not. But let's step back into high school for just one second, right? And, um, and let me first say, too, like, I love teachers, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to bash on teachers. My wife's a teacher. My dad was a school principal. My mom was a teacher. Like, I love teachers and the education system. But here's the thing. Put yourself back in that situation and you're sitting in English class, and not only did you fail the test, but the whole class failed the test, whose fault is that? Teacher. It's the teacher's fault. That's exactly right. It's not the student's fault. If the whole class fails, it was not instructed properly. People were not told what to do in the right way. That material was not explained. And it's the same in management. If people aren't meeting expectations, why do you think that is? because you didn't tell them what the expectations were. You didn't provide them the tools and support that they need to succeed in those areas. So the first thing we have to do before we say, we've got a problem, we need to look in our manager's mirror and say, is the problem me? And 90% of the time, it is. And then once you've reflected on that and you understand, nope, we are doing these things, the rest of the team is reflecting that the way that I've expected them to, the way I've defined it to, and then now all of a sudden we can kind of take a step to the person and say, okay, as an individual person, we have an area of concern that we need to address. But so we have to take a look at this manager's mirror. It's so important. Before we get frustrated with our team, look at yourself. Make sure that you are on the right page. And the last thing is really simple, the golden rule. Anybody ever heard of it before? Treat others like you want to be treated. And so as we drill that down a little bit into management, be the manager that you want to be. If if you don't like to be micromanaged, don't micromanage. If you don't like to be reprimanded, don't reprimand. Be the manager that you want to be. Now, we're going to shift this a little bit later whenever we talk about adjusting to other people's personality and attitudes. But at the core, you have to be happy with who you are. And you don't want to be hypocritical in your management style. You don't ever want someone on your team to say, man, if somebody did that to them, if their supervisor said that to them, they'd be so mad right now. You need to be able to, with a clear conscience, say, this is how I want this done. This is how I want this addressed. This is how I want to be talked to about this. This is how I want this handled. I personally, I love direct communication. Tell me what the problem is, okay? So because of that, 
Guess what my management style traditionally is? It's fairly direct. Now, I do have to understand that everybody's personality is not like that, and I've got to be able to make that adjustment, but I have to know who I am first, and I have to know that I'm probably going to, to resort back to being the manager that I want to be, being the manager that I would want to have. What, how do I want someone to handle me, and that's the way I'm going to handle situations as well. And at the end of the day, if you do that, not everyone will sleep well at night, but you will. And that's a whole lot better than sitting up saying, man, I messed that up. I shouldn't have done that. If someone, oh, if someone acted like that to me, I'd be so mad right now. At least you can say, no, I, I can justify my actions and statements because this is exactly the way I would want to be addressed. This is exactly how I would want this situation handled. And so then whenever someone questions you and says, well, that's not the way I went to, well, you're right, and I'm sorry. That's the way I would have wanted it, so that's the way I did it. Let's, let's adjust. But you know, that, you know that you are being the best version of you that you can be. So we have built the foundation, and now we go to the four walls. And so the four walls, the first of the four walls is definition. And um, this definition piece is, um, these are in order for a reason. Um, the definition piece is kind of like the, it's the starting, starting base for everything that we do in management. Um, if we don't have clear definition with the people that work with us, not, nothing else we talk about today will matter, okay? Um, in definition is where we're going to define roles and responsibilities. It's where we're going to define expectations. It's where we're going to define our accountability metrics, our key performance indicators. It's where we're going to open up our channels of communication. This is what definition is all about. If, if you aren't sure if someone, if you don't think someone's doing their job properly, you've got to go back and think, have I clearly defined what their job is? Have I clearly defined what those expectations are? Because it all has to start with that definition. And here's the beauty of definition, is if you do it properly, you also can let people know what your pet peeves are, what your concerns are, what challenges you have so they can help support you. So definition is not just simply about telling, it's about two-way communication. It's about open communication channels. You can be clear about the expectations that you have because if you aren't clear with expectations, people will create their own expectations. It's part of our human nature, okay? If I don't know what the goal is, I'm gonna create my own goal. So one of the examples that I love to use on that, I love to pick on salespeople. Um, because they're, they're annoying and easy to pick on. And so as we talk about salespeople, let's think about this. Let's think about an insurance producer. And so an insurance, insurance producer comes in to his new brokerage, and uh, he takes on this new position. And I, I should say, I've got to come up with a new illustration because I just realized as I'm saying this, I'm actually speaking to um, a room full of insurance producers tomorrow. So I'll have to think about that one before, before I do this tomorrow. But um, so let's talk about insurance producers, right? And we say, <laughs> yeah, yeah should have thought through that. Maybe I could have practiced it today. So, uh, so if a new insurance producer comes into his new job and uh, he says, uh, no one tells him what the goals are. No one tells him what the expectations are. So he just goes out and starts selling, right? Meeting everybody he knows, talking to everybody. Let me tell you about our, uh, our auto rates and our home rates. And he picks up 50 new clients this year. And everybody else, like all the other new producers, they only picked up like 40. He's killing it. He's doing an amazing job. 50 new clients in one year. No one else has done that. And he gets to the end of the year, and he sits down with his boss, and his boss says, well, I'm sorry, but your performance isn't there, and we're going to have to let you go. Well, wait a second. No, no, no. I, I did better than everybody. I had 50 new clients. Right, but we weren't worried about 50 new clients. We were looking for a million dollars worth of book of business. Well, so what happened is we just went in complete opposite directions. But if you don't provide clear expectations, people are going to create their own expectations. And so then what happens is you are sitting here saying, you know, I know what's expected of this job, and this is what it takes to do a good job. This is what I need you to do every day, but I forgot to tell you about it. Then this person over here is going to say, I don't really know exactly what I'm supposed to do, but it makes sense that I'm probably supposed to do one, two, and three, and yet you're saying, no, 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 I want A, B, and C done. And so through this definition piece, this is where we're going to outline those things. And, and what it does is it makes your job much, much easier because then all of your communication can relate back to these clear expectations that you have. And you can communicate things like, hey, I need you to know about who I am. So one thing that I do 
I've done this for years, and, and I just lucked into it, really, and I found that it worked, and so I've continued to do it, is um, I wait till someone has been on my team for about two weeks. I give about two weeks of just trying to figure out who they are, let them figure out who I am. But again, thinking back, I want to be the manager that I want to have, right? And I'll tell you one thing that I hate is learning a new manager. I hate trying to figure out, like, what do they like? What do they not like? When can I talk to them? When can I not talk to them? What are their pet peeves? What are their concerns? I, I, I hate that. Like, I, I'm on eggshells. And so because of that, I made the decision years ago, I'm not going to put any else putting anyone else through that. So about two weeks in, I usually sit down and have some sort of conversation, whether it's over lunch or whether it's just sitting in my office or whatever it is. Here's what you need to know about me. And I actually have this written on my phone. I actually have a list of about eight to 10 things that I know about me that you need to know about me. And I just go through those things. Like, hey, you need to know I'm not very creative. And so if you're looking for somebody that's going to put, you know, rainbows and unicorns all over the office, like that's just not me. I'm open to your creativity, but that's just not who I am. Um, you need to know that I love solving problems, but don't bring me a problem without a solution. That's a pet peeve of mine. Don't waste my time with a problem that doesn't have a solution. Otherwise, I'm going to get really frustrated with you. And so I I'm able to go through these things that you need to know about me, and, and I've created this clear, open channel of communication about who I am. So now I'm not trying to constantly train them to who I am, and they aren't having to walk on eggshells to figure out what they're going to have to deal with. You know, one of the other things for me is when I make a decision, I've pretty well made up my mind, but I'm open. I want to hear your opinions and thoughts. Just don't be offended if I say, I appreciate your opinion, but I've really thought through this and this is what we're going to do. And my expectation at that point is that you do it that way. And if it's wrong, that's my fault. And I'll take responsibility for that. But if I don't outline those expectations early on in the relationship that I have with my team, then we could go for months without them really knowing who I am, without bringing new ideas to me. They could, we could go for months where I'm saying, I'm so frustrated. They bring me problems all the time. And they think they're doing the right thing. I came across a problem. Got to take it to Kyle. And I'm getting frustrated saying, why are you bringing me problems? Bring me solutions. But I didn't outline that expectation. That's my fault, not theirs. And so it's in this definition piece that we open up these channels of communication and we can really help people understand this is what it's going to take to be successful in your role. And that is your responsibility as the manager to do. No one else's. Because only you know exactly what it takes to be, responsible, or to be successful in your area of responsibility. And if you do this properly, employees should never, ever, ever be surprised at review time whether it's a monthly review, quarterly, annual, whatever it is, if you execute this wall properly, no one's ever surprised. They know exactly where they stand. In fact, if you do this properly, no one will ever be surprised if they're being terminated. And I hate to say it, but part of the reality of the world that I live in is that I've had to terminate a lot of people. And I'm very proud to say that I've never had anyone surprised and in reality, most people leave on their own before we have to get to that point because they know that's what's happening. And that makes, that makes them happier, it makes me happier, it makes the team happier. Everything about that is positive. I can't do that without clear expectations. I can't do that without open communication and really defining what the role and responsibility of their area is. Yes, yeah. So, as we, as we start to walk through that, we're actually going to go through creating those expectations in your individual area. Yeah. So, so if you do this right, no one's ever surprised, which was probably going to make Alex pretty happy, right, because she doesn't get complaints. It's going to make you happy because it's going to make your job so much easier when someone knows, I know I didn't meet the expectation. And so another great segue. Let's look at our workbook here, okay? We're going to go to page five. And we're going to spend a few moments in here on creating definition. And so the first thing we're going to do here on page five is we're going, to, we're going to take a focus first on our team, and then we're going to kind of build on this, okay, step by step here. So the first thing I want you to think about is what makes your top performer stand out? What makes them stand out as a top performer? Um, now, some of you may only have one or two people. Okay? So it's going to be a little bit harder. Um, but if you only have one or two people that are reporting to you, think about the attributes of, of those one or two that really are the things you say, you know, when, when we accomplish these things, we are being successful. 
they are being successful. But here's, <clears throat> here's the key to this. This is written on the top of every single page in the second half of this workbook, and that is this. These should be objective and measurable descriptions and not vague or open-ended. So as an example, submit dashboard reports by noon on Friday every week. That's very specific. It's very measurable. There's no question whether it's done and whether it's done properly. Verse, they create reports because that's very vague. And so if I tell someone on my team, <clears throat> hey, I need to make sure that you're creating reports. You're really good at reports. I need reports created. And then they create something other than the dashboard report and they turn it in midweek sometime whenever they get around to it. They think that they are doing exactly what I asked, create reports. But if I say very specifically, <clears throat> I really need that dashboard report for a meeting that I have on every Monday morning. If you could get me that dashboard report by Friday of every week, that would be great. I know it takes about two or three hours to put together. If you could take care of that report every week, that would be wonderful. And now there's no question whether they did it or not. Because if it's 1230 and that report isn't to you, they didn't. If they send you the wrong report, they didn't. If it's not sent to you till Monday, they didn't. And so it's very clear. So that's what we want to do here as we think through this. What makes your top performer stand out? Be very, very specific, as specific as you can. Drill down. I know I've got five spaces there. It doesn't have to be five. Five is a lot, okay? So <clears throat> maybe it's two, three. Um, but think about some things that make your top performer really stand out. What makes you say in your mind and to other people, this is my top performer? So the next thing is, what makes your bottom performer stand out? And I want to be very clear as to why it's worded that way, okay? It's not because I'm, I'm good at being politically correct. It's because I hate, hate, hate the idea of a bad employee. I don't believe there is such a thing as a bad employee. I think there's a bad fit because employees are people. And if we say we have a bad employee, what we are saying is they as a person are inherently bad. And that is wrong. We don't have bad employees. We have bad fits. And maybe that's a fit to the organization. Maybe that's a fit to a manager. Maybe that's a fit to a department. Maybe that's a, a bad fit to role and responsibility. But what we are looking at here is a bottom performer. Who would we say is our, our, uh, the, the least effective, efficient, successful performer that we have on our team? And what objective, measurable things can you outline that make them that? What are the things, in a, you know, to say, I just don't like the way they look at me on Tuesdays. That's not it, okay? That doesn't matter. Because why doesn't it matter? It's not about you. Because we're selfless, not selfish. So what is it about the way that they perform that makes them your bottom performer? What would your perfect team member look like and how would you define them to be successful? And that's really the, the key point of that question. How would you define the perfect team member? And I want to make sure we're clear, there is no such thing, okay? So we're talking pie in the sky. Ideally, if I could create the perfect team member, what is it about them that would make them perfect? What are the specific things that I would define that would make them perfect for my area of responsibility? And again, five things is a lot. So you know, think in terms of maybe two to four things. So we're going to... Flip to page six, still on this idea of creating definition. This is really where we're really going to get into the meat of this, okay? So those first three questions kind of get the mind thinking, get us kind of drilling down into what this means. And now what we're going to look at is what are the three to five weekly or monthly expectations that you can define to clarify your team's roles and responsibilities? And again, I want to remind you, we're going to be very specific. We want to drill down to some very specific things here. And the shorter the time frame, the better. So... What, when possible, we want to make this weekly, okay? Daily is sometimes a little too extreme to expect, depending on your area of responsibility. Now, there are certain departments, there are certain things when it kind of makes sense that you have to have these daily, like one, two, three, four, five. If you do these five things, you're successful, okay? But monthly is a little too long to be able to measure that uh, effectively because you kind of get halfway through the month and things get stale. And so weekly is kind of the ideal, but again, it depends on your area of responsibility. Traditionally, the higher you are in the hierarchy of the organization, the longer the time frame is going to be, traditionally. Okay? So 
Um, the expectations of an executive vice president are often going to be monthly, quarterly, not daily, weekly. But again, this isn't always the case, so we're kind of going with some norms here. But what we want to do, these are the three to five things that we're going to take back with us and work on. So think about what are the three to five weekly or monthly expectations that you can define right here to help clarify the roles and responsibilities. And you want to think about your top performer and your perfect team member, okay? The reason we wrote out our bottom performer is because we need to be aware to make sure that we are thinking realistically and not thinking subjectively that I just don't like that person, but are there some true legitimate things that they are doing that they are not performing and being successful in their role? But as we define our expectations, it's not about not doing this, it is about I want people to do this. And we don't want them because you're not doing it and I don't like the fact that you're not doing it, it's I want you to because my top performer does this, because the perfect person on my team would do this. That's what we want to define here. So what are three to five things? What are three to five expectations? As you're writing, I'll tell you a quick story about this. Um, this is a huge part of onboarding, uh, bringing on a new employee, is making sure that we've outlined these things. And so uh, we had a client in our recruiting company uh, not that long ago, maybe a year and a half, two years ago. and. Um, he, he was having trouble with turnover very early on. And so he and I sat down, we were trying to figure out what was happening. And so I, um, uh, you know, I'd say, well, what was it about this person? And he would kind of talk about, well, they did well here, but they didn't do this, 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 and this, okay? So then this next person, what, what happened in this situation? Well, you know, they, they really hit the mark on these things that that person didn't, but there were these other things that they had trouble with. And so <clears throat> I said, um, I said, well, let's do this. Uh, write out like four to five things. And in his, his company, this particular uh, position, was really daily goals. And I said, um, I said, write out the four or five things that, um, that if they could do this, you would say, you know what, we're hitting the mark. And I'm not saying we're A plus, I'm saying we're C, and C passes, right? Give me the, the four or five things. And he spouted them off, boom, 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 boom. This is what they need to do. And for him, the first one was as simple as, they need to be there on time because he had issues with that. And, and the way his organization worked, he was not there. Um, oftentimes, he was on the road, he was traveling a lot. And so it was as simple as like, be on time. And that was his very first one. And then he kind of went through, and they were all very simple. But he had never outlined them for these new employees that were coming in. And so people were, in quote, missing the mark, but they didn't know what the mark was. And so they were working their tail off, but really, they aren't being successful. And so sometimes it's, it's very simple things that make the difference between someone's success and someone's failure. So as we take a look at this next piece, how will you communicate these clearly defined expectations to your team? Well, so in this next piece here where we talk about communicating clearly, then we need to figure out how are we going to take that information to the team. You can't assume they already know, especially if they aren't meeting the expectation. Okay, so we can't assume they already know. We've got to be able to take that to them, but we need to communicate it in a very clear, concise way that they understand. And so this is where we're going to think through that. So what we've done here is, is these are not hypotheticals, okay? That top question on page six, those are things that we want to take back when we leave here today, and we want to start implementing and incorporating with our team. This next piece is how we figure out what the first step of that is. How are we going to define that? Okay, maybe you have a, a morning powwow with, with your team. Maybe you have a weekly meeting. Um, maybe because of shifts, you don't get to see your team, so you have to communicate through email. Figure out what that communication strategy is going to be to clearly and kindly communicate what those expectations are going to be. Maybe it's one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe you get one-on-one -on -one time with your team members. That's great if you do. And if you have time and you don't do it now, I encourage you to implement that immediately. But, but figure out right here, how am I going to communicate this in a way that doesn't come across as, ah, the boss just got some new ideas and now we're putting these on everybody and that doesn't come across as well they got mad because you know Susie didn't get that job done and so now we all have to do this differently how are we going to give this across to say you know what's the why behind this why are we going to do this you know, this is something that that enhances the lives of the of the clients that we serve um, this is something that is an expectation from um, uh, from the executive level of the organization and that, and that we need to try to encourage this in our area of responsibility how are you going to how are you going to 
present this information to your team in a very positive manner, and that's what we're looking at here. And so now the last question we're gonna look at here is what recognition strategies will you use to provide positive reinforcement and recalibration of these expectations? And we're gonna really dive in because the fourth wall is on recognition. We're really gonna dive into this in a little while, but just think fairly high level at this point. What are you gonna do to recognize this? What are you gonna do to put those accountability factors in place? Um, to say, I've outlined the expectation, I've communicated to you what the expectation is, and now I wanna make sure that I'm providing positive, providing positive reinforcement and that we're constantly recalibrating. And that's the beauty of good definition, is that as you continue, as that becomes kind of normal language in your area of responsibility, now you're constantly recalibrating. You're reminding people this is a priority. This is a priority. These are the expectations. These are the expectations. And so it keeps people on the same page, because remember, as we talked about earlier, if you don't create expectations, they will create their own. And so you want to make sure that they're constantly falling back to the expectations that you've created. So, so what kind of strategies or recognition strategies might you be able to put in place just to help provide that reinforcement and constantly recalibrate? The next wall is autonomy. So we go through definition, we've defined the expectations, um, people know and understand what their role and responsibility and kind of why we do things, how we do things. And the next thing we have to do is provide autonomy. We have to give them the freedom to branch out. We need to let them go. So quick survey, show of hands. Who loves to be micromanaged? I'll give you time, in case you need to think about it. Nobody? Tell me what you said. <laughs> That's right. So, if you don't like to be micromanaged, what would ever make you think that someone on your team would want to be micromanaged? And yet, one of the most common complaints we hear from team members across all organizations, all industries, about their manager is micromanagement. I have yet to have anyone ever raise their hand on that question because no one likes to be micromanaged. And that's what this is all about. It's providing autonomy. It's letting people go. It's giving them the freedom to succeed. And here's the beauty. If they succeed, who does that look good on? You. So, so what we've got to do is we want to give people the opportunity to succeed, okay? We want them to spread their wings and fly. But, but just as you said, here's the other thing. You want to give people the freedom to fail because it is through that that lessons are learned and that's where people build, okay? Give people the opportunity to make mistakes. This is my favorite. I came up with this on my own and I love it. And, and I even, one of the few times I ever, you know, again, kind of threw something on social media, mistakes are the bridges between failure and success. Mistakes are the bridges between failure and success. Without mistakes, you will not succeed. It's, it's through these mistakes, it's fallen flat on our face that we say, lesson learned. I know what to do different next time, I know what I did wrong. And when someone on your team makes the mistake, that is not the time to say, I told you so. That's the time to pick them up and encourage them and say, you know what, I made a mistake like that one time, and this is how I overcame it. You know what, a lot of people make that mistake when they first start, that's pretty common, and it's no big deal. You know what I like about that is this. Let me tell you something positive that happened in that experience. That's the time to encourage them. They know they made a mistake. They know. They don't need you to remind them. What they need is help and support at that time. So you need to take that opportunity to Put a hand down and help them up. So I had, um, when I was still in college, um, one of the greatest illustrations of management I have is a gentleman by the name of Richard Wiggins. And um, he lives in the uh, um, far corners of western Kentucky. And while I was in college, uh, he was my manager. And he is really proof today that you don't have to be um, uh, you don't have to be the CEO of an organization to be a great manager. Um, at the time, he was the manager of a lumber department in a, in a uh, retail establishment, okay? And um, first boss I had at that company. I learned more from him in the time that I worked there. He was 50 years old at the time. And I learned more from him about management and about all of the principles that I use today 
than I have any other manager that I've ever had in any company that I've ever worked for. And to this day, he got out of management. He, he didn't enjoy it. He didn't want to be responsible for other people. He got out of management. He was only in management about five years from like 40, I guess maybe about 47 years old to about 52 years old. One of the greatest managers that I've ever had. And um, I started that job. I was there less than a month. And one of the things we had at this place was, um, was five-gallon buckets, okay? So if you don't know, like, it's about that big around and about yay tall, of deck stain. So imagine paint, deck stain. And we had pallets of it. And um, so I'd been there less than a month. I'm on a forklift. He's helping me, and I'm, gonna, I'm putting this pallet in between these steel beams that we're going to set down so customers can come and take their five-gallon bucket. And while we're in the middle of this, I'm on the forklift. He gets a phone call, and he says, uh, Hang on, Gorman, because he never called anybody by his first name. So hang on, Gorman. I'll be right back. Okay. So I'm sitting there on the forklift. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And I'm like, man, this, this isn't that hard, right? I mean, I just put the pallet right here. Like, I know where I'm going. Should be easy. No big deal. So as you can imagine, this story didn't end well. Um, I go ahead, and I, I try to move the pallet. And whenever I do, the corner of the pallet hits a 4x4 four four steel beam, and there was deck stain everywhere. I don't know how much money I lost to the company that day. It was, it was a lot. Um, and I mean, no sooner than it happened, I hear him coming down the aisle, coming to greet me. And I knew what was gonna happen. I mean, I'd been there less than a month. I'm getting fired. There's no question in my mind. I am terminated right now. Like, good job while it lasted. Goodbye, Mr. Gorman. And so he comes around the corner and he stops and he looks and I'm expecting him to explode. And he says, Gorman, that's what I like about you. You don't want to sit around. You want to get stuff done. And you talk about a relief. And I have never felt more, I, 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 I've never felt more connected to a manager than at that moment right there. I've, I've, I've never been more satisfied in my job. And I've never felt like someone has my back the way that he did at that moment. Because he had every right and all authority to terminate me on the spot for what I just did. I was told not to, I was told not to move. I did, lost a ton of money, did a lot of damage. And it's, I knew I made a mistake. And instead of reprimanding me, he said, this is what I found positive in this experience. You like to get things done, now let's get this cleaned up. Okay, that's great, let's get this cleaned up. And so <clears throat> that is part of this process, that's part of this autonomy, is we wanna allow people to fail. Now here's where I caution you. Um, you have to know where the areas are that you can allow people to fail and where the areas are that you say failure is not an option, okay? So as I'd said, I like to use the illustration of kids. I have three kids of my own. I have a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, a and a five-and-a-half-month-old that refuses to sleep. And so um, what I learned with, with especially the, the two bigger ones is that, um, you know, there are things that I'm going to tell them not to do, don't do, don't do, don't do, and eventually kind of have to just let them do it. So my son is all boy, and uh, whenever he was little, you know, say three years old, he constantly running in the house. You know, he'd have a ball, and he's running in the house, and he's throwing the ball, and he's picking it up, and he's throwing it, and he's running. And this was a, a nonstop cycle of uh, tornado-like activity in my house. And <clears throat> I, being the good parent, would say, Lucas, stop running. Lucas, stop running. Don't run in the house. Don't run in the house. You're going to fall. You're going to hurt yourself. Don't run in the house. Don't run in the house. And eventually, parent of the year says, forget it. Let the kid fall. And he's going to fall. And he's going to bump his knee up and maybe, you know, worst case scenario, get a little bloody nose, right? Fortunately, that, that didn't happen with him. But he's going to bump his knee up and he's going to cry a little bit. And I'm going to say, that's why, that's why I don't want you to fall. That's why I don't want you to run in the house. Okay? I don't want you to get hurt. But he's got to learn that lesson on his own. That's part of him uh, maturing and understanding. He's got to learn that lesson on his own. And so that is up to me as a parent to kind of allow him that freedom to mess up, allow him that freedom to fail. But so, but so here's where that line is drawn. Um, I like to cook breakfast on Sunday mornings for the family. And so when I'm at the stove and I'm cooking breakfast and my daughter, who's seven years old, you know, again, three or four, like she loved to help. My son, not so much. My daughter loves to help. And so she wants to come in the kitchen, and she pulls the chair up next to the stove, and she wants to get up there and see what's going on. Don't touch the stove, Lydia. Don't touch the stove. The stove is hot. Don't touch the stove. I can't let her learn that lesson on her own. I, I can't do that. That would be neglect. If I said, you know what? You keep wanting to touch the stove, touch the dang stove and see what happens. 
that's not her fault. That's my fault. Because I've got to know where that line is. I've got to know where my area of responsibility is and where success and failure can't be learned the hard way. Okay? I have to slap the hand and say, don't touch the stove. And you have to do the same thing as managers. You've got to know in your area of responsibility, what is running in the house and what is touching the stove? Where do I have to say no? We cannot allow that. We can't do that. The price is too high. The risk is too high. And where can I say, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to give you the freedom to go. And if you fall on your face, that's fine. I'll be right there to say, it's okay. Let me help you up. That's why we don't do it that way. That's why we do it this way. And it's okay. Lesson learned. And so it's going to be your responsibility as a manager to be able to do that and to understand what that looks like and where those areas are um, in your department. What forms of autonomy do you appreciate from your supervisor? So you're going to think about yourself for a second. What kind of freedoms do you appreciate? What kind of freedoms do you like? Okay. And I'll give you some examples. Maybe you like the freedom that... Um, Maybe you like the freedom knowing that, uh, that your boss isn't always looking over your shoulder, that they give you direction and they let you go. Um, maybe you're, and I don't know exactly how the, the structure at Wendell Foster works along this, but maybe in your area of responsibility, like it's not a big deal to leave at like 10 till because you need to go get to your kid's ball game. Maybe, that, maybe that's something in your area that you appreciate is, you know what, my boss knows that family is really important to me and they know that you know, when my daughter has a dance recital, like, I really need to get out about 10 minutes early so I can make it there on time. You know, and those little things make a big difference. Those little things can make a huge difference to say they care about me because my manager is selfless and not selfish. I mean, I would do anything for him at that point. Yeah, and to this day, I, I still would do anything for Wiggins. I mean, if he called me right now and said, I need something, I am there. Now, we created a great bond and friendship over the years after that, but that really, that was a moment that stood in my, my mind. And let me tell you what, Richard Wiggins was not studying management, okay? That's not the world he came from. It was just, it was just natural for him. But he knew, man, I don't need to reprimand this kid. And that, there's, I was a kid, like, there's no doubt about it, okay? I, I still am most of the time. Ask my wife. And so... He knew, like, I don't need to tell him what he did wrong, okay? But, yeah, there, there's a loyalty that gets created there. And it's the same thing whenever we provide this type of autonomy. There's a loyal, loyalty that gets created there. So how do, you, how do you appreciate autonomy from your supervisor? What are the areas that you kind of appreciate and know this is what means something to me? And then the next thing we want to look at is, <clears throat> you know, we want to try to stay positive here. So we're not doing everything wrong. If we were, you probably wouldn't be in the role that you are. So... What are some ways that you currently provide autonomy to your team? You know, there's a, there's a belief, and I believe this as well, I believe it wholeheartedly, that you should never ask someone to do something that you yourself are not willing to do. But what happens is oftentimes managers take that too far, and so they say, well, I've delegated this to someone, and so, hey, I need you to go uh, file this information for me, and now I'm going to come over here and file it with you. Well, what, what you think you're communicating is, I'm willing to do it too. And what you're really communicating is, I don't trust you to do this. And so we've got to be really careful. We've got to be able to provide that autonomy. Like, I've instructed to do this. You don't need me. Okay? And it's okay for me to let you go. And so those are some things that maybe you currently are providing autonomy to your team that you can think through and think about. What are some things that you think your team already appreciates that you provide some freedoms? And then the next thing we're going to talk about here is, um, is kind of the next step of that and how can we provide greater autonomy. You know, think about things that you're doing right now with your team that you have done in the past that maybe kind of pigeonhole them or, or um, uh, kind of hold you back from providing some additional freedoms to your team. What are some things that, um, that you're doing that you could let go of and provide some greater autonomy, give people freedom to succeed, give people freedom to fail? Where are some areas that maybe you're holding hands a little too tight and you're not letting them, um, you know, you're not letting people go? So think through two or three things there that you can do with your team to provide even greater autonomy. And then those last two questions, and, I, and again, I'm not rushing us here, but um, I'll give you a couple minutes to write after I get done, but these last two questions, <clears throat> um, an example in your area of responsibility that would be running in the house, and what would be an example of touching the hot stove? What's something that you can give that freedom and flexibility that you can allow people to fail? And what's just one or two things that you say, you know, I've got to be a part of this? Um, I'll give you an example in my world. <clears throat> 
for quite some time, in fact, really up until about a year ago, I reviewed our payroll every single week. We pay every other week. I always reviewed our payroll. That was touching the hot stove for me. That can't get screwed up. We cannot mess this up. So um, I know the person that processed the payroll would get frustrated because they felt like I was micromanaging, but I had to help them understand I I'm not trying to micromanage, but an extra set of eyes is a positive thing with the organization because we have people's livelihood at stake here. And so that was a non-negotiable for me. Like no matter how much, no matter how much he did not want me to look at this, I was going to review payroll before it got processed. That was touching the hot stove in my area of responsibility. Now, <clears throat> what's happened in our organization since is as we've continued to grow, now I have another layer in the organization and, and we gradually incorporated that into her role of responsibility. So now I still have two sets of eyes on it. It's just not my set of eyes. Someone else is reviewing that because it's still touching the hot stove for me. I want it to be reviewed. I don't want to take a chance but now there are other people in the organization that we were able to delegate that to. And, but then the beauty of it is once this other person's there and I say, you know, it probably makes sense for you as my director of finance to be the one that's reviewing this. And so <clears throat> I'm going to show you what I look at and what I look for. And now I, I'm done. Hands off. I don't touch it. I haven't touched it in a year because I've given you the freedom to do that. And so what was once touching the hot stove has become something now I can back off and say, okay, I, I know we've got a process in place, we have a procedure in place, I trust the people to do this, I'm going to let them do that. Because my goal was not that I saw it, my goal was that it was reviewed. And so if I am still meeting my goal, it doesn't have to be through me. My goal is to make sure that two sets of eyes review that every time. So that's just an example in my world of what would be touching the hot stove for something that would be... Um, you know, where I might tell someone, well, hey, why don't you call that client and get this information from them? And now I'm just going to let them go. Like, I know how I would say it. I know how I would do it. But it doesn't matter. My way is not necessarily the right way. It's just my way. And so I'm going to let them go. I'm going to let them try that. I'm going to let them try their own. And then come back and say, I might have messed that one up, Kyle, because whenever I called, they said this. And I think they were kind of frustrated about that. Okay, well, let's talk through that. And so that, that's where I'm going to allow people to run in the house. Like, go try this on your own and let's see what happens. So <clears throat> the next thing we want to do, the next wall that we are going to build is around sociability. Um, <clears throat> this can be a tough one for managers. Uh, this concept of not only allowing sociability, but actually what we want to do is promote sociability, encourage, and even participate in the social aspect of your department. Uh, <clears throat> studies have shown that this is one of the greatest factors in job satisfaction, much greater than money. Um, if you feel like you have friends, relationships, and connections at work, you're much more likely to be satisfied uh, with your job. You're much more likely to be loyal to the company. Uh, one of my favorite studies shows that a five-minute social interaction at work, okay, so what this means is standing around the coffee pot you know, on a Monday afternoon. Um, uh, that means swinging by somebody's desk and talking about what you did last night. A five-minute interaction provides greater personal and professional health than a 15-minute break. And so <clears throat> think about that in your shoes as a manager. Where are you going to get the greatest productivity? That everybody goes and takes a 15-minute break, steps away completely from their desk, from their role of responsibility. They walk away. They clear their mind. 15 minutes, they come back, take some five minutes to kind of get back, ramp back up and figure out what's going on, or, 15 minute, or a five-minute conversation, and now they walk away refreshed, re-energized, ready to go. <clears throat> and so you need to encourage that. And how we're going to encourage that is we're going to participate in that. Now, <clears throat> what I want to caution you on is don't leave here, and um, don't leave here today and then immediately start being chummy-chummy with, uh, with your team because they're going to know something's up. Okay, it has to be very authentic and be very natural. But <clears throat> what I would encourage you to do is uh, when people on your team are talking about their weekend, when people are talking about what they did last night, when they're talking about their kid's ball game, their dance recital, whatever it is, join in the conversation very naturally, like you, did, like you would with anyone else in the world. Just join in the conversation. Oh, how was that ball game? You know what? You mentioned, you mentioned that, uh, that your daughter had a dance recital yet last night. How was that? Did you get any, you have any pictures? I'd love to see them. Okay? 
understand what's important to those people. So if they love their cats and you hate cats, look at stupid pictures of their cats, okay? It's okay to do that. So what happens is if you as the manager, if you see, if you all are sitting here talking and you're chit-chatting a little bit and I walk by and I give you the, right? But how many times have we done that? And now I've created separation between us. I've, I have done the opposite of creating loyalty. Now it's you versus me. And now it becomes, oh my gosh, I can't believe him. Every time he goes by, he does that. And you know he's not doing anything. He's going over to his office, propping up his feet. He sat in meetings the last three days. He hadn't, he hadn't even done anything. We're just sitting here talking real quick. I've been working. Do you know how hard I've been working? I wish I was a manager. Right. Yeah, I wish I was a manager. I'd make more money. I'd have less stress, right? But that, that's exactly how it starts. That's what happens is we create that separation as opposed to something very natural. And I cannot express this enough. It has to be natural to say, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't mean to interject, but I heard you talking about this. And um, yeah, I think my cousin was at that. How was that concert? That was really cool. Right? We chit chat for a minute. Now here, now let me give you a little management secret, right? Here's the great thing is now I control when the interaction ends. Because if I create, if I'm part of this conversation, if I not only accept it, but I encourage it and I participate and we're talking for a few minutes and I realize, eh, maybe we're getting a little too long. Hey, I'd love to stay here and chat, but I know I've got a few things I've got to get done. I'll talk to you all later. What do you think they're going to do? <laughs> that jerk. Can you believe him? His cousin went to that concert. No. Yeah, I guess we should go back to work too. And now I've created a little bit of control over that situation. But the other thing does is it creates that sense of loyalty to you. It's no longer us versus them. We're all in this thing together, Okay. And so we want to create this form of sociability in our area of responsibility that people feel like they have a connection to us, that people feel like they have a connection to the people that they work with, that we truly are a team and it's not, well, I, you know, I've got the people I work with and then there's our boss over here. That's not what we want to create. That's not healthy. And so we want to be part of the social interaction. We want to encourage that social interaction. We want to participate in the social interaction that, that um, uh, that our team is able to experience. You can't take it too far. And we're going to talk about that, this kind of blurred line, because unfortunately it's not incredibly black and white. But, you know, just as an example, um, it, it's one thing for me to sit and have a great conversation about that concert. It's another thing to say, hey, you all want to go to that concert tonight? That might or might not be appropriate. Okay. And some of that depends on the relationship and friendship that you have. But here's what you have to think about. Is it's not necessarily, well, you know, I've known Alex for years, and we hang out outside of work all the time. So it's not a big deal that we're going to that concert. Now, the big deal is that everybody else sees this favoritism because, yeah, you know, Kyle and Alex are hanging out outside of work all the time. Okay, so you have to think about the whole relationship and how it interacts with the team. Because whenever you step into that management role, remember, our responsibility changes. It's not about us anymore, and we have to make decisions that aren't necessarily the most comfortable for us. And so we want to encourage sociability, but we also want to make sure we don't blur that line of manager. And, um, you know, uh, one of the companies that I worked for in the interview process, it was a terrible interview process, um, and I mean that just from a, a personal stress perspective, uh, it was an eight-hour interview, and... Um, the first part was about an uh, hour and a half, two hours. I had eight um, vice presidents and CEOs sitting there with me, and it was a big panel interview. And then after they got done, each person had one-on-one -on -one time with me. And um, I, it was awful. I mean, I, I just cannot tell you how exhausted I was at the end of that day. But, but of course, I had questions as well. Um, and that was a company I worked for where I, had, I managed 13 count executives in, in, um, in, that, in that realm of responsibility. Um, these were all, you know, highly educated people. Um, we traveled a lot. We worked very hard. And one of the things that I asked about uh, in that interview process, I asked each person individually, what is it about this company that makes you want to come to work here? You've got skills that you could take a lot of places. Why do you come to work here every day? And without fail, every single one of them in that one-on-one -on -one time mentioned the people. I love the people here. I love the people culture here. I love how connected we are. I love the relationships that we have. And, and I'll admit I was a bit intrigued 
um, I accepted, you know, I, I was offered the position, accepted the position, and, and, um, and I was a bit intrigued to find out how true this really was. And let me just tell you, it was amazing. I've never seen anything like it. Um, the company that I'd come from before was very strict eight to five. Like, show up at 7.59 and you're sucking up to somebody, and like show up at 8.01 and you're late. Like that, that's kind of the culture it was. It was like eight to five, you're there. If you leave 10 minutes early on a Friday, like oh, what's his problem? He's gonna lose his job, right? That, that's the way we did things. So I go into this new company and I'm, I'm accustomed to this very um, kind of strict culture. And, um, and I thought we worked hard in that business. Um, so I go into this new company and uh, eight o'clock was a joke. I mean, people were there at 7, 7.30, 6.30 in the morning. I, I had a drive, I drove about 45 minutes to get to work, and so I like to get there early, be traffic, and, and it, so I'd usually get to work between 6.30 and 7, and I was rarely the first one there. Eight o'clock meant nothing, and five o'clock meant nothing. If you leave at five, you're leaving early. And no one thought anything of it. It was just part of the culture. It was just part of what had been created there. But anytime something went wrong, it was all hands on deck. It wasn't about where that department messed up. It wasn't about what that person did wrong. It was, we've got an issue, everybody's involved. And I was amazed at this, this idea of work hard, play hard, and just how true that really was at this company. That 50, 60 hours was the norm, and no one thought anything of it. No one felt like they were being overworked and underpaid, even though we paid 20% less than our competitors. But people loved their job, and they loved their job because they loved the people. We had people, in a, we had 300 people in a call center, in multiple call centers. We had people in our call center that had been there for over 20 years and would never leave because of the people. They loved the people. There was a loyalty to the people. And it's all because of this wall. It's all because of this wall of sociability, because they had built relationships and they built friendships. But the other thing that this company did, which I thought was amazing, <clears throat> was where they promoted this was the all managers and above within the organization once a year would get together off-site not for a meeting. I remember one year we went and had a wiffle ball tournament all day long, grilled out, coolers, hanging out, it rained, it was muddy, weather was terrible, and we had the greatest time. Just hanging out with each other, grilling out, playing wiffle ball. We put together little teams and had a wiffle ball tournament. There was no business conducted whatsoever. Every other week, there was a standing meeting on the company calendar every other week at three o'clock to go to a local bar. And you'd see everyone from entry-level call center employee to the CEO. You never knew who was gonna show up. Whoever was available anytime between three and seven on a Friday night, they were there, hanging out, chit-chatting, getting to know each other. I remember whenever I started, the CEO took me around and um, I was, I was truly amazed how he knew everybody. And we would go through, and it wasn't just he knew names, because that in itself is impressed to me, because I'm terrible with names, but like he knew people. And he would talk to someone and he would say, hey, how's your son doing? Hey, how was that ball game last week? Hey, how about the Steelers, right? I mean, he was talking to people like they're friends. And I thought it was like just him putting on a show, and it wasn't. Like he really knew these people. He had friendships with these people. He had relationships with these people, and they respected him for it. And so whenever he said, this is something we're going to do, and this is something that's important to this organization, guess what? We did it because we respected him. And so much of that was because of sociability. He had encouraged that in the organization. And so, <clears throat> again, let's go, back to our, uh, let's go back to our workbook here, and we're going to talk about this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look in the manager's mirror. How do you enjoy sociability in your role? What are some things that you appreciate from your supervisor, basically? What are some things that, that, uh, that you are able to do or allowed to do um, in your role that really helps promote sociability? And so what, what are some ways that you potentially discourage sociability in your team? You know, think about some of these things that we talked about. Uh, I know you're busy. We're all busy. And so sometimes that scowl on our face walking by a couple of people talking around a coffee isn't because we're mad at them. It's because, gosh, I'm stressed, I'm busy, and they've got time to chat. And so it's about me. But what do we have to do when we become a manager? We have to forget about me. And so it's worth taking that extra time. And so what are some things, maybe even inadvertently, that you are doing to discourage sociability with your team? Or maybe what are some things that you are very intentionally doing because you see it as a waste of time? 
What are some things that you think, you know, my team's always doing this. I've got these two people or three people, and it seems like they're always doing these things, and it's so frustrating. And maybe what you're really doing is you're discouraging sociability. One of the, uh, there are a lot of employment satisfaction surveys out there, um, and almost all of them will talk about this function at some point, this concept of sociability. Um, one of my favorites actually says, do you think you have a BFF at work? And, um, and I know a company that, that administers this, and that is part of their normal language, is my BFF at work. They talk about it all the time. Like, this is my BFF at work. This is my BFF at work. Well, we used to be, and they'll joke, you know, this used to be my BFF at work, but then they went to another department, and we don't get to talk anymore. You know, it's, it's, that's kind of normal conversation for them, is this concept of BFF at work. And, um, and with as much as I don't really understand all of the, um, uh, you know, all of that, the slang, I guess it would be, like, I get that. You get that concept that, like, if you feel like you have a, a real friend at work, someone that you can hang out with, confide in, you're going to see that person more than you're going to see your family. And at least in the case of your spouse, you got to choose them. You didn't even get to choose the people you work with. But you're going to spend time with them. So if you can build those relationships, now you're loyal to the company, you're loyal to the people around you. And so what, what are some ways that you may be discouraging that in your role? And so let's take this the second question, and then we're going to take it to the next step, and that is, how can you further encourage and participate in the sociability aspect with your team? Maybe you can't implement a wiffle ball tournament in the rain, okay? I get that, but there probably are some little things that you could do to encourage that sociability. Now, again, what I want to do is I want to caution you that you cannot leave here today and say, okay, I'm going to be social with my team, we're going to hang out, we're going to talk, it's going to be awesome, we're all going to be best friends. If that's not you naturally, that's going to be really, really awkward whenever you leave here, okay? So don't try to do that. It has to be very natural. And, and, and the, way that I would, the way that I would encourage you to think about that is, we're going to go out on a limb here, let's think about them as real people. Like every other social interaction you would have. They're just people. Talk to them like real people. That's what really is going to start encouraging this sociability with your team. You know, the other thing that happens whenever we encourage this, um, and I'll give you one example of a great way to encourage sociability is group projects. Put people together. Let them work together. Don't keep people segregated. Don't keep them separate if they don't have to be. If these two or three people work well together, that's key. If they work well together effectively and efficiently and they can do it while being social, let them. Put them on projects together. That promotes cross-training. That promotes loyalty. Their day flies by. They're happy to come to work. Everything about that's positive. So that, that's one thing that you might try to think of. What are, some, what are some things that you can do in your area of responsibility just to help bring people together like that? But, <clears throat> but so as we had talked about this last question, and this is for you specifically, what do you need to do to be cautious to not blur the lines of management? And for each person, this is different. You know, so maybe it is like, hey, you know, I love hanging out with my friends to go watch Monday Night Football. Probably not a good idea for me to ask members of my team to go do the same thing, okay? And I don't know, maybe it is. Like, that's something you have to figure out, is where is that line? What makes sense and what doesn't? As you start to um, participate in this with your team, those lines will start to get more and more blurred, and it's going to be up to you as the manager to keep it defined. Because that team member, as they start to feel that friendship, will say, hey, you know, me and my buds get together to watch Monday Night Football, you should come over. And with as fun as that may be, you have to say no. That's exactly right. It's the same with the drinking example. Like, you may love going down to Gambrina's and having a drink. That may, you may love doing that on a Friday night. And you may see people from your team down there, and that's fine. I encourage you to go over and say hello and ask them what they're doing out that night and tell them I hope you have a good time and it's good to get some time away from the kids. Like, that's wonderful. Have that conversation. Why? Because they're people. And we want to have those conversations with people. What I would encourage you not to do is say, hey, great, can I have a seat around on the house, right? Like, you don't do that. That's where you have to draw that line and say, like, I want to, I want to encourage this and I want you to know, like, I'm a real person too. Look at me. I'm out also, but I'm not out with you because I still have to create that line. But what you can do then on Monday is say, hey, did you have a good time? Did you all have fun? What did you all do? Tell me about it. It's, 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 it's really simple if you just think, like, just people, just people. But understand also within those people, you are, you are going to be accountable to a higher standard. 
And you, you took on that responsibility when you decided to become a manager. People need to hear a job well done. This recognition piece is what ties it all together. So we've created a definition, we give people the freedom to go out, we, we encourage them to communicate and build relationships with their team and with each other and with you, but then we've also got to make sure we're circling around and we're recognizing people for a job well done. Sociability, autonomy, and recognition over and over and over and over again in job satisfaction surveys is consistently, those three things are consistently higher than pay in job satisfaction. Sociability, autonomy, and recognition, and they come in different orders at different times. I have them in this order for a reason, because I believe it has to start with that foundation. It has to start with you. You've got to define roles and expectations. You need to give people the freedom to go, encourage those relationships, and this recognition is kind of the, it's what ties it all together. So as we go through this whole building process, this is the end result. This is where you tie it in to what you did in this definition piece. This is where you go in and you encourage, you provide um, you provide positive reinforcement, you provide recalibration of the expectations that you've created. People want to hear a job well done. Here's the challenge that you have in this. You typically are going to resort to the recognition method that you prefer. So everybody's different, okay? We know that. And, um, and what you have to understand is how each person on your team prefers to be recognized. And then you have to recognize them in that way. And the reason being because it's not about you, right? It's about them. And so you've got to make sure that you are stepping out of your own way to find ways to recognize people. Now, a few challenges come into this. One is this. If I'm standing here and I've got 100 people in a straight line in front of me and all of them are lined up perfectly, I'm only going to see one person. And then right about number 50, they're kind of stepping out a little bit. They're out of place. They're not where they're supposed to be. When I'm standing here, what am I going to see? I'm going to see the one person out of place, and that's what I'm going to recognize. And I'm going to say, you're wrong. You, number 50, you are wrong. But I got 99 other people that are doing it right. And where I fail my people is when I don't tell them they're doing it right. And so if I'm going to be selfless and not selfish, I need to move over so that I can see everything, so I can see everybody so I can see what's being done right. I need to get out of my own way so that I can see what's happening in front of me. And that's gonna be your responsibility to do. And so we oftentimes see the wrong, it's very difficult to see the right because we expect it to be right. And so we have to really, we have to very consciously think about what are we seeing that's working? What are people doing that they should be doing? And we need to recognize those things. Now, preferred method of recognition. Um, you typically are going to revert back to your form, your preferred method of recognition. If you like just a one-on-one, -on -one, job well done, pat on the back, that's what you're going to do for everybody around you. And that's not bad, but for some people that means nothing. Some people want public recognition. You know, maybe it's something just as simple as they want the team to know. Other people, like they want a press release, they want the newspaper to know about it, and I want it on Facebook, and I want it on Twitter, and I want selfies with like duck lips and peace signs, right? Like this is gonna be awesome, look how great of a job I did. And I, I personally can't stand that, but guess what? It's not about me, right? Who's it about? Them. So if that's what they need, guess what I'm gonna do? Hey, Facebook, check out what just happened here, okay? So. My preferred method of recognition is one-on-one, -on -one, pat on the back. That's what I prefer. Now, here's the challenge that you run into. As a manager, you've got to determine for each person on your team what that is. Because if you take someone that likes that one-on-one -on -one recognition pat on the back and you give them the public press release, they are embarrassed. And what happens? If they're embarrassed, they don't want to do it again because they don't want that recognition. And now you've just hindered your ability for them to be successful. You've actually hurt yourself and you've hurt them more than you have helped. And the same holds true for the person that loves public recognition and you give them a little pat on the back and say, hey, nice job. They didn't even hear you talk. They were not recognized. And so, and I, I learned this the hard way. I uh, had a gentleman that worked for me that was amazing at what he did. He was an account executive and managed some of our largest clients. And he was incredible. And I told him every time we talked, so at that point I had weekly one-on-ones, one hour one-on-ones with every member of my team. And every time we sat down, I would say, man, that was great. Hey, 
overheard that conversation. That was wonderful. We traveled a lot to go visit our clients. Hey, last week, whenever we were, you know, wherever, down in Miami, and we were with this person, just want you to know the way that you managed that meeting, it was, you did such a great job. I'm so proud of what you're doing and everything. I, it was constant. I mean, like, I felt like I was stroking his ego constantly to the point that it was very uncomfortable for me. It was nonstop. And so what we had was um, I had developed a, a tool in which we went through, um, we met every week, and then once a month we would kind of look at this um, career development plan, and then quarterly we would review that. And it was just something I'd incorporated along with the annual review to kind of help people get to the career path that they wanted. And so um, one of the things that I would do in that monthly session is say, what can I do? You know, manager's mirror, right? What can I do to help support you? What additional tools and support do you need that I am not providing for you right now? And so we sat down after I felt like I'd constantly stroked this guy's ego, and I said, what else can I do for you? You're doing such a great job. What else can I do? And he said, I'd like to be recognized a little bit more. And I mean, my head was about to explode. I couldn't believe it. I was like, are you serious? I mean, like, I feel like all I do is tell you how great of a job you're doing. Like, that's, that's all I say whenever we're together. But here's the problem. He didn't hear that. He wanted public recognition. He wanted his team to know. Now, he didn't need it in the monthly newsletter, but he wanted his team to know how good of a job he's doing. Now, I'm going to be honest. I did not follow my rules whenever that happened. I was mad because I got real selfish there. And I thought, how can he possibly say that? Like, I have gone out of my way to recognize him. I've not gone out of my way to tell him how good of a job he's doing. And he's going to sit here and tell me that what I can do to support him better is recognize him more. And I thought, what kind of ego do you have to have to need me to do that? And then you know what I realized? That kind of ego. And you know what I did in the next team meeting? Everyone, just want to let you know how great of a job he's doing. Because what's it matter? Get out of my own way. Tell him he did a good job. Because what's he going to do next time? The, thing, the same thing that I just gave positive reinforcement on. The thing that I said, you know, if you do more of this, you're going to continue to excel in this role. That's what he's going to do. But when I kept telling him one-on-one, -on -one, I might as well just kept my mouth shut. I should have been talking to a wall. He didn't hear it. And that was my fault because I did not recognize what his preferred method of recognition is. That's my responsibility. That's your responsibility. And you've got to get your ego out of the way and say, this is what I need to do. But don't think that just because it's the way you want it done, that's the way that everybody's going to want it done. Now, here's the beauty of this. It's so simple to figure out. If I walk up to someone passing them in the hall and I say, hey, you saw what you did yesterday, nice job, and they glow, that's their preferred, rec preferred method of recognition. Real simple. If I tell them and they say, oh, okay, thanks, it's probably not it. And if you mention it in a team meeting or you put it in an email and you get that little smile on their face, that twinkle in their eye, guess what? That's their preferred method. Do it again. It's really easy to figure. You can figure it out before the end of this week with every member on your team what their preferred method is. Take note of it, pay attention to it, and do it over again. And that's how you're going to recalibrate. That's how you're going to make sure that they don't start creating their own expectations. If you've done the definition piece successfully, you've created, you have, you have defined for them what the expectations, what the goals, what the strategies are. And so what we're going to do is we circle this back around in the recognition piece and we make sure that they know you're hitting the mark, you're hitting the mark, you're hitting the mark. Hey, wait a second, maybe you didn't hit the mark there. Now you're hitting it again. And then we constantly recalibrate. We constantly remind them, this is the mark. That's not the mark. This is the mark. Hey, I know you did this thing and you think that's good and it is good. I'm so proud of you for doing that. But ultimately, this is the mark and this is where we're focusing on this mark. This is our target. So it's, we don't want to use this as an opportunity to tear people down. We say, oh, I saw that. The insurance producer, I saw you brought in 50 new clients. That's great. Here's what I'd love you to focus on. Let's see how we can get those 50 new clients to a million dollar book of business. Let's keep focusing on that. Great job on the 50 new clients. That's a great start. You did a good job here. And the power of and, what would be even better is if we continue to do this. Not, yeah, you brought in 50, but you know what you just said? I ignore everything I said before that. You brought in 50 new clients. That's great. And what we can really focus on now is bringing in a million dollars in a book of business, as opposed to saying, you know, you brought in those 50 new clients, but our real goal is, it doesn't matter what else you said. They did not hear that they did a good job. So it's up to you to figure out what that is, and that's how you get to reinforce definition. Now, I'm going to caution you on one more thing. This has to be authentic. So again, 
don't leave here today. Go straight to your team and say, great job, everybody. This is wonderful. And I just, I can't tell you how appreciative I am of everything that you do. And I want you to just keep doing it. And this is amazing. Because they're going to say, yep, went to a training today. Now we're, we're shifting gears. And next week, we'll be right back to where we were before. You can't do that. It has to be very authentic. And if you can't find something, there's a problem. And the problem's probably you. Okay? I know I'm putting a lot of ownership on you because, frankly, there is when you take on that responsibility as a manager. But the problem's probably you. So if you are looking at even your, your, your bottom performer that we talked about in this definition piece, and you're, looking at this, and you're looking at this bottom performer and you're saying, I can't figure out what it is they might be doing right, get out of your way, look at them, and say, you know what? I don't need an A+. Plus. I need a C. And when you hit this C, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you did a good job because now I want you to focus on that C again. I'll focus on the C, and then I'm going to try to get you to C+. And so what we're going to do is we're going to finish up our workbook here, and the next time when we get together, we're going to take this to the next step, and it's going to be about coaching. And we're going to talk about how we coach these employees and how we, we take them to the next level. When we see someone that is hitting that C-level expectation, how we get them to a C+, how we get them to a B, how we continue to improve them. So let's finish up our workbook here. First thing we're going to do is look in the manager's mirror. What, what is your preferred method of recognition? That's the first thing you've got to understand. What's your preferred method? You probably already know this. What's your preferred method? And listen, there's no wrong. Don't think, oh, you know what? He kind of laughed about people that like to be publicly recognized, but that's me. That's okay. That's you. Be you. Be comfortable with that. Be confident in that. I want team recognition. I want public recognition. Good for you. Know that about yourself. And then look at how are you currently recognizing your team members? What are you currently doing to recognize your team? What are some basic things that you've already just, that have just become natural for you? And then what are some recognition strategies that you may not be using yet? What are some things that could benefit your team? What are some additional things that you could kind of, kind of take to the next step, take to the next level? And these last two questions are really important as well. And again, I don't want to rush you. You keep working at your pace, but we'll kind of go through them for those that are there. How will these recognition strategies provide positive reinforcement to your team? So we have to understand why we are doing these things, okay? We don't just want to go through the motions. Why are we doing it? So one of the reasons for recognition is positive reinforcement. Will these recognition methods and these strategies that you are looking at and thinking about implementing with your team and with individuals, will they provide positive reinforcement? If they won't, shift. Think of something else. So you want to be able to answer that question. How will this recognition strategy provide positive reinforcement to my team? How will it encourage them to do the same thing over and over and over again? And I'm not going to dive into the psychology studies that have been done for years on this, but it's really simple. Positive reinforcement works, okay? Positive reinforcement works. Tell them you did, you tell them you did terrible, tell them you did terrible, tell them you did terrible, they don't know what to do right. You tell them one time, when you did this, that was great. Thank you so much. People want to do it again. People, it's just people. It's just inherent to people. Kids, adults, doesn't matter. Tell them what they did right, they want to do it again. So how can these recognition strategies provide positive reinforcement? And the last one on that page is, how can they help you recalibrate? Because one of the other great benefits is it helps make sure that we're always on the mark. We're always on the mark. I, I appreciate and I love the fact that you got these 50 new clients. But how do we get that million dollar book of business? That's our goal. This is a great stepping stone to that goal. But this is our goal. Let's make sure we're on the same page. And we always want to be talking about it, okay? Not berating people, but talking about it. Make it just part of normal conversation. Make it normal parts of your meetings. How do you continue to encourage this and recalibrate so that everyone stays on the same page all the time? And it's through these recognition pieces, once we've defined and then we get to this point of recognition, that's how you're going to make your job so much easier because you're going to allow people to fly. You're going to allow people to go. And whenever it comes time to review, everybody knows because you've, you've been providing this constant recognition, this constant reinforcement. No one at this point can say, if you do it properly, no one can say, well, I didn't know my goal was this. If you do it right, they know because you've continually explained and helped them understand where the mark is, where that target is.